So you're in your truck in South Dakota. Yes, I am. And you're just calling me just like really excited. Yes. What are you Okay, let me What are you looking let me, at? Let me set the whole situation. I am north and east. Sorry, that's my sunroof opening because I want to see what's above me. I'll tell you why in a second. I'm north and east of Rapid City near Ellsworth Air Force Base because we were you know, on a long call and I was like, ah, I'm just going to drive around town a little bit so I can extend our conversation because windshield time. So I was like, ah, I haven't been out to my grandparents' old place for a while. They bought an abandoned Nike missile site that was the only home I ever knew them to own. And it's still out here, though it looks a lot more overgrown now. And so I just figured I'd drive out and look. And on my way out here, I look up and I, I see what looks like two giant eagles right overhead. I did a double take, and they are not giant eagles. They are huge bombers with what looks to me like retractable wings. Is that ringing a bell for you? B1 Lancers. Is yes. that awesome? Because it looks awesome. It, it's awesome. Those are supersonic bombers. And, uh, yeah, those are just... Re- are the wings out or swept back? Where are the wings right now? The, the wings don't look like they're a part of the aircraft. They, they kind of look out of place a little bit. Correct. That's exactly how I would describe it. Okay, are the wings out? Like at about, you know, I don't know, not quite 90 degrees from the side of the plane, but maybe like 70 degrees? Or are they kind of tucked in tight? Uh, no, they're they're out. Uh, definitely not ninety degrees. I would say, yeah, seventy ish would be a good descriptor. I mean, they're not they're not like sticking goofy, stupid, straight out like how you drew a plane when you were a kid. But they're also not tucked away like a you know a fighter coming off of a, the deck of an aircraft carrier. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, dude, so, he's coming uh, right over the top of me. I want to hear it. I, I I don't know. Let's I mean let's try it. Here I'm rolling down windows. I'm in the truck. Are you driving or stopped? I just stopped. I, I'm I'm literally at my grandparents' house that now somebody else lives in. Oh, they have it all mowed. They must have taken hay off of it. That's cool. I can hear it. Okay. Oh, here you go. Yep, listen. Putting you on speaker. I got, I got nothing, nothing man. man. Dang it. I, th- I, think you, I think you Bluetoothed away or something. No, I was still there with you. You just can't hear it. Like, I can feel it as much as I can hear it. So it's a low, a real low frequency. Yeah, it doesn't sound like a, it doesn't sound like a normal jet. Oh, I'm hearing it better now. Can you hear that? I can't, and it causes me emotional pain. Ah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going to keep trying to chase I- it. I've never actually seen one of these, like, fly. I've never seen one fly. I've, I've seen them, like, in museums and stuff. But, yeah, it's awesome. What are they doing? Are oh. they just in the pattern? Are they just doing touch and goes? Well, okay, touch and goes. That's what they're called. Yes, that's what they're doing. So, I, I guess I didn't know if that was the right term or not. That's what my grandparents called it. So, okay, let me let me set the scene a little bit better. My grandparents old Nike site, chain link fence compound. I mean, it's, it looks like the kind of place where you'd get shot if you went in, but you wouldn't because they were wonderful people. Is It sits on a ridge opposite Ellsworth Air Force Base. There's this just great big dances with wolves, rolling deep ravine prairie in between here and there. And I'm getting to a place where I can send you a picture of that. And so what we would do as kids is Grandpa, who was a marksmanship instructor on the base, like, I don't know, he knew somebody or whatever, he would be like, all right, uh, we got to be out with the binoculars at this time. And then we'd go out and, oh, this is amazing. And we'd we'd look out the back window, Grandpa and I, and we would see just these uh, stuff that looks like a building in terms of size do these touch and goes. They would come in on the ridge touchdown they disappear behind the edge of the ridge and then just boom they would they would flash out the other end of the ridge and that's what i'm seeing there are two of these you said b1 lancers yes there yes. are two of these b1 lancers just doing circles and so i am on the if if the runway is at 12 o'clock i am at the eight o'clock of the circle that they're running right now 
Right. And it's so weird, dude, because in, in within the same 30 second span, it'll look like these things are moving at breakneck speed. And then it'll look like they're just floating in the air. And it just has to do with how they bank and which way I'm encountering them from. So right now, one of the two is down somewhere on the runway on the ridge. And I don't know if he's landing or if he's going to pop back out the far end of the ridge. No idea what to expect here. What I like about the B1 Lancer is it's got hips, right? It's it's like... Those don't lie. Yeah, they you know, it's got four engines on the bottom. Oh. And it just... It just kind of looks like the the Camaro, like the <laughs> the old Camaros. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I think I can picture yeah. it. I mean, yeah, like a bit of a girthy backside. Yeah, exactly. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, it, it looks like it looks like there's a tremendous amount of engineering uh, that went into making it go fast, and all the go fast is in the back, and all you know, it's pointing in the front. I don't know. It's just a really cool look, but. That means it has to have really tall landing gear, I would assume. So you're seeing the, the landing gear come out, right? The landing gear is out the entire time. There's a, there's a light under the nose of the plane. I assume that that has to do with landing apparatus. Yeah, and absolutely. It's on the whole time, or it looked like it was on the whole time they made this last loop. But yeah, the gear is definitely out. And they're they're low, man. Like I'm I'm getting a good look. There have been a couple of places where, if there were no cockpit and somebody were waving at me, I could definitely wave back. It's close. It's very low. That's fun, dude. Yeah. Thanks for calling me. Uh, it's amazing. I was raised around this and raised by you know a grandpa who was very excited about this, and I just didn't appreciate it. I mean, th- these are my earliest memories being at this place right here with, you know, the, the kennels, the huskies being raised out in the, out in the yard, looking out for rattlesnakes and watching the predecessors of this generation of bomber touch and go and make these laps. I remember the sound and I remember also being like, yeah, okay, whatever. And now I see it because of my friendship with you. I think I just know just barely enough more to appreciate how ridiculous what I'm watching in front of me right now is. So thank you for helping me appreciate something that my grandpa, who's now gone, tried to get me to appreciate. It makes me feel things. I feel the same way about my granddad, right? He really wanted me to learn all the trees and learn like the leaves of the trees and the bark. And so we would go walk in the woods and I was kind of like, oh, that's cool. Oh yeah, of course that's a gum tree, granddaddy. Oh, that's an oak. Yeah, okay. I can, you can tell because of the way it is. Mm-hmm. I could answer all the questions that he had, but I didn't understand what we were doing. Like, what, I didn't understand he was, I was just on a walk in the woods. I didn't see that he was trying to impart appreciation and knowledge deep in my soul like he was. And so, like, to this day, I wish I knew the trees better. So mm-hmm. I'm starting to try to understand oak trees. You remember me telling you about a red oak the other day? I do. I have one of those in my backyard. And how do you know it's a red oak? Because of how it is. <laughs> no, seriously, the leaves. How do you know? Um, I don't remember now, but I went straight out after you told me what your granddaddy tried to tell you. And I looked at that oak and was like, oh, this is a red oak. Because it's the shape so of the leaf, but I don't, remember, I don't remember what you told me. The leaves are pointy and uh, knives are pointy. And if you get stuck with a knife, it'll draw blood, and blood is red. Therefore, a pointy oak leaf is usually a red oak. And a rounded and oak leaf is usually, well, it's going to be anything but a red oak. It could be a white oak. Mm-hmm. There's several different types of white oaks. And uh, the one that's really hard for me to understand or figure out is a willow oak, because their leaves look really small, and that's hard for me. Anyway, the point is, I wish I had paid more attention to my grandfather as well. Yeah. And it's like there's this gap of youthful ignorance or yes. lack of appreciation. Yes. And if, if I could go back and slap young Destin and say, you have a finite amount of time to enjoy the company of this wise person. I'm, I'm doing the same with my dad now. I'm, I'm, you know, he's teaching me a lot of things and I ask a lot more questions than I used to. I used to ask a lot of questions, but I ask with different intent now, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, 
stuff is always slipping through my fingers. I had no idea about that when I was a kid. Just getting away from either. me. And and now that I understand that a little bit, it's like I want to grab that glob of very dry, very slick sand even tighter because I don't want any of it to slip through my fingers. But I take those huge handfuls, and the bigger the handful I try to grab, the more I feel a little bit of panic because the bigger the handful, the more slips between your fingers. And I feel that as a dad, and I feel that as a son, and I feel regret about that as a grandson. I mean, I'm, I'm still driving around, like now I'm down the hill from the place, and there was a rattlesnake here. My grandma drove me down here to fish for bullheads on the little creek, on this little bridge right here. And I got out of the car. We were in a, an old Datsun 210 that she drove around. I got Dude, out of the that's car. what I learned how to drive. My granddaddy taught me how to drive a, in a stick shift Datsun B210. Uh, we continue to have more in common than I thought. <laughs> I also learned to drive on a Datsun 210. Did I, you really? I could start with literally, that was my first car. I could start it with literally anything I could fit in the keyhole. <laughs> anything would start that vehicle. And anything? Anything that could fit in the keyhole. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I tried lots of stuff. What do you mean? So at any rate... Oh, uh, like a screwdriver. Came to, Go ahead. Uh, heck yeah, I started it with a screwdriver. We came down here, and we parked right in this spot where I am right now, and I hopped out glibly, and I hear this sound. And I'd never been around a rattlesnake before. I'd heard lots of talk about them, but you know, I don't know what that means. And Grandma, who was a very strong very wise woman of the West, woman of the wilds. I was like, Matthew, do not move. Okay, I hold still. And somehow, right under the front tire, she had just missed running it over. Sure enough, there's a rattlesnake coiled and ready to strike. And she had an ice scraper, like a big long ice scraper. And she just came around and deadified that thing. Like, just... <laughs> She just killed a rattlesnake with an ice scraper right in front of me. And I was like, you, I, you're awesome. Like, you are an amazing person, and I love you. But I still didn't appreciate it then like I appreciate it now. Just what that means. The nurturing, the protection, the knowing what to do-ness, the bravery. I just, just wonderful people. And I have to battle the urge to remember them with joy instead of regret. That regret impulse could sneak in and wreck a lot of those memories. Because I am sad that I didn't take from them everything they wanted to give, that I didn't, I just didn't know what to do with it as well as I would know now if they were still here. Do you remember meals with your grandfather? Yeah, yeah, I do. My grandmother used to make kraut and weenies, we'd call it. <laughs> what, would, what would your grandparents make? I'm tickled you asked because th this is important that I get to say these words on the podcast. He would make something called goulash, which has got to be like some Eastern European macaroni stew slop kind of stuff. It seemed like it would be horrible, but it was edible. And then he made something that he called mulligan gut stew. And I what? think he invented that name just to torture his grandchildren. <laughs> I'm going to give you little pukes a big thing of mulligan gut stew. <laughs> and then he actually would give us a big thing of mulligan gut stew. I have no idea what was in it, but no, I, I right, right there over there in that house, I ate mulligan gut stew as a kid. It was incredible. I enjoyed this episode that uh, we recorded back when you called me or whatever. Or I called you. I forget how it went down. But... Uh, we have a sponsor for this episode, and we should talk about that sponsor. We do. This episode is sponsored by HelloFresh. And as always, here's exactly how it works. Get fresh, pre-measured ingredients and mouth-watering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door with HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit delivery service. America's number one meal kit. HelloFresh lets you skip those trips to the grocery store and makes home cooking fun, easy, and affordable. Yeah. HelloFresh is flexible. You can pause HelloFresh if you go out of town, things of that nature. It's also delicious. I mean, it's good food, teaches you how to cook, simple, easy-to-follow recipe cards. You're going to love HelloFresh. It sounds like everything that I've ever eaten with HelloFresh is better than mulligan gut stew. I'm not going to lie oh, to you. Oh, <laughs> miles. But you know what happened in that house? I remember 
grandma pulling out an old recipe card. And it was just handwritten on a little three by five card. And it just said pancakes. And she had me read it. I was maybe 10. And we stood right there over the stove, over the griddle. And she walked me through each step. And she gave me her little grandma tip. Like, hey, when you start to see the bubbles on the top of the pancakes, it's time to flip them. And it just occurred to me that assuming the role of grandma in teaching me cooking things for the last couple of years really has been HelloFresh. I mean, nothing personal. I feel, you know, more personal warmth and affection toward my grandma. But it's really cool that someone is still speaking into my life and teaching me how to do this stuff. Here's the problem, though, with with the old recipe cards, because there's a, a recipe book here called Cotton Country Cooking. Everybody has it, and all the grandmas would put their recipes in. It was very difficult to follow the recipe because it was like three lines, bake until blah, 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 and you're done. Mm-hmm. I can't follow those, and I screwed it up every time I tried anything out of that cookbook. However, HelloFresh makes it easy because it tells you exactly what to do. It leaves no room for misinterpretation and I know you know I'm telling the truth because you've done it wrong, I'm sure, Oh, when you try to read that Heck stuff. yeah. And the little 3 yeah. by 5 card works fine when you have your grandma right there to be like, it should look exactly like this. And to describe <laughs> it, the card is the next best thing to have in somebody who knows what they're doing, looking over your shoulder and pointing out exactly what it ought to look like. And we save all of those cards. Oh, yeah, we do too. So here's the deal. If you want to try this, go to HelloFresh.com slash 80 ndq and use the code 80NDQ to get $80 off, including free shipping. That's a pretty big deal. That's a lot of money. Yes, it is. And on top of that, HelloFresh does this thing where they're donating food to people in need. So far this year, they have donated 3.5 million meals, and that number is still ticking up. So every time you jump in, you buy this kind of thing, you're also helping people who need food get food. It's a big deal. All right. So here's the deal. You're smart. You know what we're doing here. You know we like this stuff, and we're not just making this up. HelloFresh.com slash 80NDQ. Use the code 80NDQ at checkout. Get 80 bucks off. Free shipping. You're going to dig it. Yep. It's easy and stress-free. Super flexible. You can pause if you're traveling. Skip a week whenever you want to. And it's a more sustainable way to do food in general. HelloFresh is awesome. We love it. You can try it out by going to HelloFresh.com slash 80NDQ and use the code 80NDQ to get 80 bucks off, including free shipping. It occurs to me that the sponsor could literally be your grandma. You need a grandma hovering over you, (laughs) and that grandma's HelloFresh. So you can can get grandma by going to HelloFresh.com slash 80NDQ and use the code 80NDQ at checkout to get 80 bucks off, including free shipping. Was that too much, Matt? It was much, right, right on the edge. <laughs> was it really? <laughs> okay. But it was fun, though, right? It you see fun. what I was trying to I do? Li- I liked it very much. Is yeah, that what you're I saying, or am I running with that? No, 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 no. I, I, f- I feel that as well. I, I do regret not... Uh, it, it feels more like the opposite of FOMO, fear of missing out. It, it's like huh. the knowledge that I did miss out. <laughs> K-I-D-M-O. Kidmo, huh. K I D Kidmo, Kidmo. The knowledge that I no knowledge I did miss out. I don't know. Whatever. So that's the feeling that I feel. But of course, there's a lot of things I didn't miss out on. I'm sitting here on the internet looking at the inner bomb bay of the B1 Lancers that are flying. Are they still flying? Or are they in the pattern still? Uh, let me look. I got obsessed with a bizarre <laughs> physical phenomenon. I need to tell you about in just a minute. Uh, right now, they seem to be down. I don't see them. Uh, I got the okay, so open. I don't see him. One thing that's interesting about that aircraft. Okay, think about this: you're going at supersonic velocities, and you open your bomb bay. I don't know that they can do that. Can they? Can they drop bombs at? I don't think they can. I have no idea. Be, I mean, it's. I mean, my bombs. stupid primitive. I don't know anything. Brain says, wouldn't that break things? Yeah, I. I don't think during so it can rapidly deliver. Let's see features. I don't know if it can deliver bombs while supersonic. But think about this: there's this whole thing when you drop a thing off of an aircraft called safe separation. So what, what's it called? What separation? Safe. Uh, Sierra safe. Alpha Foxtrot Echo. I know you're on the phone. Okay, yeah, I thought you said stage, like like a space shuttle or a rocket. But I understand now. Okay, so think about this. Imagine. You're in your car going down the road at like 80 miles an hour, and you have your hand out, and there's no 
lift force on your hand because you're shielded by the windshield of the car, right? Sure. Yep. As soon as you move your hand out of the window, like just push it six inches out of the window, all of a sudden you get all of the drag associated with the air that's moving by the vehicle. Instantly. It's like when Iron Man does the thing where he's going at crazy, crazy speed and then he deploys those drag wings and he just, boom, drops back behind those jets that were running with him. I don't know the exact thing you're talking about, but I I can visualize it. Okay, cool. So as you put your hand outside of the, the vehicle, the angle at which your hand is positioned matters. And if it's just slightly offset, like two degrees away from the vehicle, then all of a sudden, boom, your hand will just run away from the vehicle because you have a lift vector pulling your hand away from the, the vehicle because you have air running past your hand, right? Yeah, I can very much picture that phenomenon sure what happens if you're going 600 miles an hour in a bomber in a b1 lancer you open the bomb base and you drop a bomb and it goes from the shielded like running along with the aircraft air inside the bomb bay and then it immediately drops into the slipstream or whatever you want to call it into the the passing air and it does it at an angle that's a half a degree tilted towards your aircraft instead of away what that happens? resistance pushes a gigantic how many megaton bomb right into the underbelly of your craft. Yeah, exactly. Which I, I would be against if I were piloting that craft. <laughs> like, no, yeah, that you don't have to worry about it going off cuz you know, they've got fusing and stuff to keep it from going off. But, I would think at that speed it would still be really disappointing to get hit by it. Yeah, exactly. In the past I talked with a lot of guys in the Air Force and there is a whole field of study having to do with safe separation from an aircraft. Like, that's a whole thing you can become an expert in. Huh. Like, how do you get a thing away from your aircraft without destroying your own aircraft? And how do you get that thing away from your aircraft in such a way that it ends up in stable, I, I'm going to call it flight, but it's a ballistic trajectory. Like, how, how do you get that thing to go away from your vehicle and also fly in a stable manner so that it doesn't kill you? Well, I mean, didn't the earliest bombs get dropped literally by hand? Like you That's just my lean out the window and hold a bomb by the tail fin and be like, man, there? Yeah, it's very complicated lawn darts, right? <laughs> very, yeah, but equally as dangerous. <laughs> like the munitions you, being you know dropped the... from a plane is very similar to the actual game of lawn darts in terms of death toll. Do you know about the Norden bomb site? No, what is that? Oh my gosh, dude. Oh, you have the Norden bomb site, N O R D E N. So in World War II, the Americans had figured out a really interesting uh let's put it this way. There's a ballistic computer they designed that was all mechanical. And you could drop bombs and actually hit what you wanted to hit because before you had like a closed loop guidance solution where you could actually guide the bomb to the thing you want to hit. Like in more recent wars, I mean, they were literally dropping concrete JDAMs on houses. Do you remember the JDAM? Well, I no. Well, maybe. Yes, we've talked about that before. Remind me. It's a joint direct attack munition. So like now there's just a bunch of bombs used by America that's like a very specific bomb and in like the NATO countries and so they got so good at dropping the bomb where they want the bomb to go they, they literally fill them with concrete and they're like we would like to <laughs> you know that donkey in particular is bothering everything let's make that donkey <laughs> go away you could do that sort of things like oh they're using a pack mule to carry IEDs up this ridge Let's just make the pack mule go away. And so yeah, you literally a drop bummer a for concrete the donkey. Weapon. donkey didn't pick that. But I mean, <laughs> yeah. some vessels are predestined for destruction, I guess. Sorry, buddy. Hope that wasn't Gus the field goal kicking mule. That's a beloved animal. So a piece of concrete, you could, I mean, so people were dropping concrete, but you're talking right now about targeting systems on bombs that are so reliable that you could hit only Gus the field goal kicking, now munition carrying mule. Exactly. Yeah, that's what that's what happens now. Okay. Because they have closed loop guidance. But back in the day, that didn't exist. So somewhere in between like being able to 
you know, <laughs> exterminate a particular brick on a house and dropping things like lawn darts from, you know, back in the Monford von Richthofen days. <laughs> so somewhere between lawn darts and, like, making it go within a bomb diameter of where you want it to go, there was a, a, a big mechanical slash mathematics problem, and that's how do you do this? How do you figure it out? And the Americans did it. It was, well, did it pretty well. It's called the Norden Bombsite. And so every bomber that flew over at, at one point um, during World War II is when it was developed, but it was used you know, all the way up in the Korean and Vietnam Wars. This bombsite, you could dial in exactly where you wanted a thing to fly. And so it had to take into account like what type of munition you were dropping, had to take into account your altitude, your velocity, your, you know, not only the direction you're flying, but where is the wind? Like you have to take all of this stuff into account and it's super, super complicated. And so For this example, site there, was about getting all of that dialed? Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Yeah, you'd have a guy in the back of the bomber looking through an optical piece, and, and he was looking exactly at, you know, the area you were trying to bomb. And if you knew your altitude and you know your direction, all this stuff, there's these crosshairs, and you can put the crosshairs on the target. So imagine down below the bomber, you're looking out at a 45-degree angle at the ground, or you're at some angle of the ground, right? Yep. It would take into account where your sight was looking, and then it would control, my understanding is it, it it would control the timing of when the bomb was dropped. There was this whole thing, like you've got all these bombers that has this super secret, it's kind of like the Enigma machine that the Germans had to communicate, right? So you, you have all these bombers with this super precise bomb sight, and then you got all these German fighters trying to shoot it down. What's the most important thing to protect on the bomber? And that's the bomb sight technology. There's this whole thing about wartime security surrounded the, the Norden bomb site. Where is the Norden bomb site? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, God, I, I have failed you. No, 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 like on the plane. Where is the Norden oh, bomb okay. site? It's inside the the bomber, and, and there's a human that looks through it. You took, so it's, my, it's you took near... my question to mean, like, what geographical location is this site where bombing occurred? <laughs> yeah, I thought no, I, no, no, I thought no, no, I no, no. I'm tracking it. with you. What I'm at, you're saying that it had to be protected so what i'm saying is where is it located on the actual plane and what steps were taken to to keep it functional i have no idea dude i would love to know the answers to those if there was a book on the norden bomb site i would read it there's got to be a book was it's, it it's a whole thing was it the kind of thing where you were doing math on paper in the early days with this like yeah. you had mathematicians on the bomber figuring out have you ever, how to make this go or did did the I, I'm just trying to understand the device you're describing or or did it do all of those calculations in like some kind of primitive analog computer format I, I'm looking in my drawer I don't have it with me but um, one of the things I did is I, I used to shoot mortars and a mortar is just a you, you know how a mortar works. You drop it down a tube and then foomp, right? Yeah, sure. That's a good sound. It sounds a lot like the supersonic baseball cannon. Foomp. <laughs> yeah, so if you wanted to hit something a thousand meters away with a with a mortar, how would you do it? Uh, trial and error. I mean, if, if I had to do it in a Red Dawn scenario and I had plenty of shells, I would just gradually dial it in. I'd take into account elevation and wind and I would take my best guess I'd see where the first one hit and then I'd try to adjust okay so first of all this episode is sponsored by Raycon they make earbuds we love them but second of all you know how in lots of these little spots where we've talked about Raycon you've mentioned that if you lose them it's not the end of the world because of the price point yeah well I lost mine recently and you're right it wasn't the end of the world. It was not the biggest thing on the front of my mind when I lost them. How'd you lose them? Uh, it, they were sitting in the truck that I was driving in when you and I recorded the episode that's happening right now. But then my truck got stolen out of my driveway, and they also got my Raycons. So resultantly, what, 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 I was just—I was okay with you know. I just didn't think much about losing the Raycons because of the price point. Oh, and because my truck got stolen. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Dude, I'm so sorry. I know you know that it got taken, but yeah, no, yeah. it's it's okay. It's a uh, uh, you've handled this well. Oh, thanks. You've handled this very well. It's it's weird to think that the episode that we just were mm-hmm. listening to mm-hmm. was recorded in the truck that you no longer that own I no because longer someone own. yes, uh, two someone people, literally came to your house to take yes, it. Yes, they did at three thirty seven in the morning two days ago, and they just uh, they took it. Yep, yeah, it's uh, I guess it's theirs now. You good? I hope they're enjoying those Raycons because I'm telling you, <laughs> I really think they're an excellent earbud, and I will miss them. <laughs> But here's the positive. We're going to have to do a whole lot more sponsors, buddy, <laughs> in order to get that truck yeah, back. Yeah, it's going to take a couple. But yes. no, dead serious. I just got I got some other ones. So I'm opening these up right now. The real story here is not my stolen truck. The story is these Raycons that I have right here. Did you get the E55? I is the ones you ordered get that? I the E55. Okay. And I'm opening right. them as I, we speak. Okay. I remember when you ordered those. Lovely kind of turquoise ish box. Oh, is it going to have the magnetic? Hold it up so I can hear it. I want to hear you open it. Okay. It's got the magnet in Yeah. It does have that. I can't quite tell you. I haven't broken the the plastic seal. There we go. Breaking that now. Okay, to be clear, these are the E55s. These are the Performer. These are not the E25s, which are the everyday earbuds. Yeah, this is still um, Okay, so let me tell you why I like these. Um, they have a different mechanical design. So the E25 is just great. It's fine. The E55 has a longer playtime on the charge. The little pill is bigger. Uh, I call it the pill, but the little box that that you hold the earbuds in, you charge the box, not the earbuds. It's bigger, has a bigger battery, and it's USB-C. So you can charge it with the charging cable for my laptop. Uh, Yes, for my phone. That is nice. Yeah. Okay, you ready for the opening sound? Yes. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, it's got that little that little I got new electronics foomp. Ooh, this is cool. There's this nifty little card in here. It's all sophisticated. All right, that's my little book. I think I can figure out how to use these. Okay, I am popping this open. Oh yeah, it is a different pill. It's more it's more of a rounded rounded edge square. And yeah. as I pop it open, the earbuds are arranged a little bit differently, but the same iconic Pop out it's got a little feel. lanyard thing on it. You see the little lanyard loop hole oh, it thing? Does. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lanyard in there. You put that little lanyard thing on there. Mm-hmm. You can hang it up like where you hang your keys. That's what I do now. Yeah. Oh, I like the way these feel better. I've been telling you that for how long? Yeah, that's that is ear ergonomically very satisfying. Ergonomically. Oh, look what we did. <laughs> Yo, we just look did what thing. we did. Yeah. Oh, I dig the whole thing. The the slight Upsizing is not a turnoff for me. They still snap back in, behold. And now I'm going to close it. Oh. Yeah. That's lovely. It's good, isn't it? Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I haven't listened to you, them yet, but I really like dude, the layout. This was worth getting your truck stolen no, just so we could uh, do I'm this. I'm going to just straight up level with you. It, uh, no. No, it wasn't. But, but you got new Raycons, and it wasn't the end of the world. consolation prize. It wasn't the end of the world. <laughs> My Raycons are gone, but now I have new Raycons. Thank you to everyone who supports the sponsors for the podcast because that will help Matt pay his deductible. <laughs> 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 They're really, really good uh, earbuds. If you would, go to buyraycon.com slash NDQ and get 15% off your order. That's slash November Delta Quebec for no dumb questions and get 15% off your order. This was brought to you by Raycon. And we enjoy their products. I love the E25s. I'm excited to try out the E55s. I think you're going to dig them too. And you got the holidays going on, Christmas coming up. The Raycons are right in the perfect price range for about what I normally give to my friends for a present. So this is something that I'm going to be giving away this year. Might be a good idea for a holiday gift for people in the third chair as well. Buyraycon.com slash NDQ to get 15% off your order. What would you adjust? Um... Well, because I don't really understand how to fine tune a mortar, I would adjust that front leg. I'd adjust the elevation of the shot. So if I I needed to get that shot further, I would lower the height of the front of the triangle. I would lower my stand. And if I was overshooting it, I would raise it. Okay, so it's actually more cool than that. You can do exactly what you're saying. However, you could also raise the mortar higher and add more charges to it. So there's like several different ways you can hit the same spot. 
So if you're good enough, you could raise the mortar and fire with four charges. So the ba way a mortar comes out of the thing is there's four little, some people call them cheese charges, but it looks like a mouthpiece, looks like a football mouthpiece. Huh. And you just clip it on the tail of the mortar. And so you can fire with no charges, one charge, two, three, or four charges, oh, right? Oh, I understand. Yeah I, yeah, I can picture that. I've seen that. Okay. Yeah, and so what you could do is you could like tilt that thing really high in the air and you could fire it with four charges and then you could fire the next one with one charge but you could lay it over and the arc through the air, one would be really high and one would be really low and the only difference would be the flight time of the mortars. So you're saying that what we picture as a mortar shell, that really isn't the explosive munition, that's the I mean, what a child would draw when they picture a mortar, what you picture from G.I. Joe, that's really the delivery system. The charges are in the tail fin. Uh, no, the, the the thing, no, that is the explosive. The thing that you draw is the explosive. The charges, they, they literally look like a mouthpiece, and you just click them on the tail, and then they either fire or don't fire. But it's, uh, long story short, if you were to do what you're talking about, and you were to angle it over, and you said, I would dial it in, you can literally draw a curve that tells you where it will hit at what angles and what charges. And so when you open a box of mortars, there's this thing inside of it called a whiz wheel, is what we call it. It's actually a nomograph. I can't think of which any is jokes a about that. No, it's a mechanical computer. And you say, where am I at? How far do I want it to go? And so you just, it's a wheel that you spin. There's like a piece of clear plastic on the front with a line on it. And you say, I want it to go 2,000 meters. And you spin it to 2,000 meters. And the whiz wheel says, oh, you can do it with two charges at this angle, three charges at this angle, or four charges at this angle. What do you do with wind? And these are the, oh, wind, you just have to know what you're doing. You just have to know what you're doing. Okay. Um, you can take into account wind through the sight. Um, like when you fire a mortar, you actually look through a sight to get azimuth and then you level this thing up to get elevation. And so, I don't know, it's, my point is it's all math and it's all mechanical computers. And that's what the Norden bomb, bomb site did is it had all the mechanical computers and those nomographs kind of things built into it, which is pretty rad. So the predecessors so, of the planes that I am watching circling above me, well, no, they're still down. I don't see them right this second, but the predecessors of the planes that I have been watching while we've been talking. They weren't dropping it out the window, but they were doing math on sheets of paper or with an analog, simple spinning paper computer to make calculations. Is that what I'm hearing? They actually had a mechanical device that did it. It's, it's, they basically had an antikythera mechanism built into the underside That's of the exactly bomber. That's exactly what I was pushing you toward. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I'm guessing that's not what the Antikythera mechanism was for, but if you, if back in the day, the Greeks who came up with whatever that confusing little piece of analog computer equipment turns out to have been for, it would make sense then that it might have been used to calculate something that would involve a parabola, something involving an arc, because that's one or of the most... Lips. Sure. Which yeah, makes astronomical calculation orbits. a yeah, likely exactly. possibility then. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, in, in fact, we we know that the Antikythera mechanism has ellipses built into it. That's part of the thing you and I learned when we studied that. What, what, what episode was that? <laughs> uh, I don't know, a long time ago? I'm, I'm going to say in the 30s. No way. 021. Not even in the Holy place. cow, dude, that was 21. We've been doing this for a long time. What are we, what are we at right now? This is 99. But if you count the half wow. episode, this is 100. So I think we did one that was like something 0.5. I don't remember even why. Um, Golly, man. I'm sending you maybe, a picture maybe right keep, now. Okay. Uh, maybe if we keep doing this, it'll get fun and we'll start to like it. <laughs> yeah, I would like to get there someday. Um... This is my grandparents' property. Yeah, those are definitely B-1 Lancers, and they were flying in uh, formation. That's awesome. What is that? You just sent me a picture of what looks like a creek with some type of scrub brush, and <laughs> that's very clearly a rib cage on an animal. Um, yes, I wanted to talk to you about this. 
So I drove down below the property. This is where the rattlesnake incident happened with my grandma. And we only went down there to fish once or twice. We would usually walk to a closer expression of that same creek. Um, it looks like what happened there is there was a high water incident this spring, I assume. And five carcasses that I could count are in that photo. There's the obvious deer carcass, but it looks like some fox and coyote carcasses got washed into that bramble and are all just sitting there rotting out. You can tell by the paws on the uh, coyotes and foxes what it is, but I don't think anybody put them there. I think they were just all somewhere in the creek, and when the spring melt happened, they all got jammed into that spot, and there they'll sit forever. That's crazy. My son wanted to go camping for his birthday, so we did. And uh, the boys just ran off into the woods, and they're like, we're going to go exploring. And they, like, had machetes on their hips and stuff, you know? Oh, I should do it. One of them was wearing throwing knives. <laughs> <laughs> Those are hyper-reliable in cartoons. <laughs> he just had a sheath, like, strapped to his thigh with three throwing knives. And I was like, yeah, I got some throwing knives there. What's that about? He's like, yeah, it's a... Uh, we're going to go out into the woods. I need some weapons. I bet the security guy at the Magic the Gathering tournaments has to take a lot of those off of dudes. <laughs> Dude, I... Uh, anyway, long story short, they found bones in the woods. But moving to the other topic, I hyper overestimated the efficacy or the capabilities of throwing stars and throwing knives when I was a child. <laughs> Who doesn't? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> why, why do you say this? Do you remember that episode of G.I. Joe where, like, they were like, oh, they're coming, and they ran into the door, and they shut the door, and he, like, was leaning up against the door, like, whoa, that was a close one. And all of a sudden he goes, ugh. And they're like, what's the matter? Why aren't you talking? And then he falls down, and there was a there was a throwing star that had stuck through the door <laughs> and got him in the back. You know, that doesn't killed him. sound like something that would happen in G.I. Joe, but I can picture an incident like this. Whatever. I don't know what it was, but I just remember, like, oh, my gosh, it's a throwing star, and it's a poison one. They're basically invincible. <laughs> or venomous. <laughs> <laughs> you, you had throwing stars as a kid, right? <laughs> well, you and I bought a throwing star at a gas station oh, one right. time in Florida. <laughs> hey, this gas that's station's right, got we throwing did. stars. We should get these in case our families are in danger. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, I'm going to ask you to back off of my wife. I should let you know that I have a throwing star in my hip pocket. <laughs> However, if you dodge the first one, there is not a second. I could deploy it in a time of emergency. <laughs> oh, crap. Quicker uh, than you get your the, hand on ST that gun, sir. <laughs> <laughs> that's, been, that's fantastic, dude. <laughs> yes, I have a throwing star and I have a throwing knife. And they're in the bottom of like a junk drawer somewhere that my kids reach into with their bare little mitts looking for candy because they're so undangerous that even if they clumsily ram their hand into said throwing star in the dark in a junk drawer, they'll be fine. Man, I wonder if there's a place where like throwing stars are illegal because I know knives are illegal in the UK. Yeah. Right? I, I, I have my opinions, but yes, that is the truth. I wonder if throwing stars... Dude, we should we should start a campaign about how dangerous throwing stars are and just see if some politicians get on board. <laughs> we should make up a fake person who got killed by a throwing star and like come up with a whole story about them. Timmy's, see if they Timmy's can, Law. See if they can get them to name the law after that person. <laughs> <laughs> Young oh, Timmy Johnson golly. was senselessly murdered by a throwing star in a drive-by throwing star incident. <laughs> It wasn't even intended for him. It was intended for a rival Yakuza <laughs> gang member. <laughs> oh, man. We should probably stop. We're getting to that funny place. <laughs> <laughs> throwing stars take lives. Gas station throwing stars need to be banned. <laughs> Florida. It would be Florida, man. Oh, oh God. absolutely. Well, that's where we got our throwing stars. <laughs> we are Florida, man. <laughs> Shame on us. <laughs> <laughs> oh man well this was a weird episode thank you for calling me on this side of the road while you watched b1 lancers uh taxi around or go around in the in the pattern that was fun it's amazing and it's just 
It's just a plane that it's a thing that doesn't look like it should be able to do that. It's a thing that doesn't look like it should be able to be in the air. And so that's amazing. And then also the existential moment of my grandpa is gone and I miss him. And there was so much there that he wanted to teach me about and get me to appreciate. And some of it stuck and some of it didn't. And thank you for, thank you in a weird way for helping me connect with my grandpa by building into me an appreciation of something that I just, for whatever reason, did not fully internalize that he was trying to give me. Is your grandpa buried near there? No, grandpa's buried in uh, Iowa, maybe just on the Illinois side. I think he's buried just on the Illinois side, back by his family home. Have you ever been to his uh, cemetery, his grave, the cemetery where he's at? Yeah, I went and I, I was, I mean, I, I was there for the service and I was a pallbearer for him. But no, when he was going to die, dude, I remember driving down this exact road right here. He contracted plumism from all his time on the range right over there on that hill. And it just slowly beat him down. He had a bunch of chemical hypersensitivities. And um, so I came out, boy, he looked, he looked real skinny and beat down. And um, we talked all day. I, I did not have time to make the trip to see him, but I did. And then I was driving down this road and about right here at this little pullout, I was like, I'm just not ready to be done with that relationship. I'm going back. I flipped around and hung out and blew more stuff off and just came back in to hug him. And he knew why I was there. He knew that it just just wasn't ready for goodbye. And <laughs> Sorry, man. Yes. Yeah, so it was just a very, very so difficult goodbye. I really miss him. So right there. They happened right there where you're at right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you were close. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and something as silly as talking with my buddy and looking at planes. Uh, hmm. Yeah, I just... Yeah, I just miss him a lot. And this is a neat point of connection for a relationship that... Yeah, I just miss him a lot. You get what I'm saying. I get what you're saying. I, uh... I pass where my granddaddy's buried often, and I do this thing where I I raise my finger. You know, you know when you're driving in the south and you meet a yeah. car, a familiar car on the. You know that you know what I'm talking about the yeah, southern wave. Yeah, we do that wave. here too. Yeah. <clears throat> so I've started doing that without telling the kids what I'm doing. Every time I pass that cemetery, I just do the southern wave yeah. at the cemetery to to grandmother and granddaddy, and uh, it's an interesting thing. The the other day I went into a framing shop. And I was getting something framed, and the lady there says, Destin, I have something to show you. I was like, yeah? She said, look at this. And she pulled out two pictures, and I said, why on earth do you have a picture of my grandmother and my granddaddy? Why do you have this? And she said, oh, it's your your aunt is getting them framed. And I was like, is this what I think it is? And she said, yeah. She said that your grandfather had this painting made of your grandmother when he was overseas in Japan. I was like, that's exactly what this is. Hmm. And gr- granddaddy had had a picture made of grandmother. It was painted on silk in Japan. It was amazing. And so uh, I just thought it was awesome. And then hmm. it was a picture of him as well. We don't know where the picture of him was, what was created, but I don't know. It's a really big deal. Grandmothers and granddaddies are important, man. It's a big deal. Yeah. <clears throat> Somebody should tell kids that in a way that gets through their <laughs> thick skulls so they appreciate it better while while they have those relationships. Yeah, I've uh And I feel like I appreciated it a lot, but still not enough. Yeah, I've uh I leave things for mom and dad to do with the kids. Like uh you know the horses for example. My daughter loves horses. And she really wants me to participate, but I leave that for their relationship. Just like dad left a Datsun B210 driving lessons for me and granddaddy. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's smart. Yeah, I could nurture that better. That's smart. All right, man. I think I'm going to let you go and let you be at your granddaddy's place. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, thanks. Uh, this is fun. Thanks, buddy. Thanks for calling me, man. I really appreciate it. Yep. Talk to you in a bit.